Kia ora koutou, uh, namai haere mai, and uh, thank you for the chance to uh, speak to you this evening. I'll just turn on my stopwatch, because otherwise I'll talk forever. There we go. Paid to do this. Anyway, um, co Dr. John Hopkins Tenney. I'm a, a professor of law at the uh, University of Canterbury Law School, obviously. And this evening I'm going to talk to you about this subject that we have on screen, law without lawyers, does legal education have a future? Now, in, uh, in choosing this topic, those, some of you might know me, and it might seem a bit of a surprising topic for me to talk on. I'm actually a, a comparative public lawyer. I specialize in uh, multi-level governance and administrative law, and more recently, law and disasters. But um, so therefore, the, the, uh, this topic might seem uh, a little bit strange. And in fact, it's a topic I had to I, that I originally gave for my inaugural lecture. This is another, another iteration. And I apologize in advance if anybody um, was at that original lecture. The jokes have not got any better. The, um, but this choice of topic um, reflects my, my belief, my um, uh, core belief, that I'm a teaching academic. Now, I use the term um, advisedly. I'm not a teacher. I get pissed off when academics call themselves teachers. Now, I am Scottish, so to be honest, I get pissed off quite a lot. <laughs> um, the university did a, did, a, did a special psychological survey where there were green people, you know, nice, nice people, blue people, a little bit cold, or red people. I could have saved them a lot of money. I'm red, you know? We'll start from that uh, premise. Anyway, I return to my topic. Um, so I'm not a teacher, and I get pissed off when academics call themselves teachers because my father was a teacher. And the reason for that is that teachers are trained to teach. That's what they do. That's all they do. They're focused on that. I'm an academic. That's a big difference. I try to help people learn. I try, at least. I try to help people learn through my research. And as the late, great Mike Taggart, who was a, a professor of public law at Auckland, the university who was taken from us far too early was wont to say, the moment you stand with 200 eager faces in front of you, uh, willing to be filled with knowledge, which is amazing, our students actually do want to learn, is the moment of your greatest influence as an academic. Not when those books you write, not those journals, not the stuff you pour your heart out getting, getting done. The time when you teach those students. And that moment is research driven. It's the stuff you've learned in, in, in the university environment. It's the stuff that you've researched, you've discovered, that you can then pass on. And it's this that is at the heart of the teaching research nexus that, is, uh, that drives the model of academia that we have in New Zealand. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that model. And it forms the heart of what I'm going to talk about today. And so um, I chose to talk about the future of, of legal academy and, and um, law teachers and legal academics. Um, but then I thought, well, that's great. I'm interested in that as a topic. But let's be honest, not many other people are. So um, I thought I needed something that's going to draw a crowd on what might be a cold evening. And I thought, killing lawyers <laughs> would fit the bill. And sure enough. Here you are. Um, now, I, uh, thus I arrived at this topic, but to clarify and to disappoint you, I'm not actually going to advocate the killing of lawyers, per se. Um, I'm being told uh, that's cruel, apparently. Uh, some of my uh, human rights uh, lawyer colleagues have told me that uh, these human rights apply even to lawyers. Who knew? Um, but in fact, I'm taking the demise of the legal profession, at least in the, as we currently understand it, as something of a given. Um, Dick the Butcher, from the famous Shakespearean quote, might get his own wish without lifting a finger. Because lawyers might, I think, probably will in the context that we understand them today, die out all on their own. So I'm going to briefly turn to these challenges that the legal profession has in a second, these changes. But my main focus, or the main focus of this talk is actually what this means for the future of legal teaching, 
for the understanding of, of law at universities, for legal academics, for law schools, and for, for universities more generally. Put simply, does the teaching of law have any future in this, in this brave new world? So firstly, we need to turn to the, the current, uh, do we need to briefly explore the current crises that, the, that face the legal system and the legal profession at the, current time, at the present time? Now on this topic, I stand on the shoulders of giants who have examined far more effectively than me the various problems that Western legal systems face. Although I've styled this talk as future looking, if you will forgive the cliche, the future is now. I need not remind a well-educated audience such as this that this, excuse me, is, I can't read my own writing. That's, that's always a bad sign. It's to do with getting old and glasses. Anyway, whatever. Um, is, <laughs> that, uh, that society is changing at an astonishingly rapid uh, pace. Increased automation, automation and the growth of technology is having ever greater impacts upon our lives. And these changes are already impacting upon the legal system. But it's often forgotten that the, much of the reason for this is nothing to do with the growth of technology itself. If the legal system already operated effectively, technology wouldn't have the fundamental impacts that it's currently having and is predicted to, to go on having. Anyone remember the Segway? The Segway, remember when this first, the Segway was first introduced? It was going to revolutionize public transport. We were all going to be standing on these things. Didn't tell us what it was. It was just this amazing thing that was going to come out. And then the Segway appeared. And guess what? It didn't. All that Segways do today is get in the way when you're visiting some nice tourist place in Europe with these fools driving around trying to kill you. Or indeed in Hagley Park. Now the reason that the Segway didn't take off was because transport techniques were relatively adequate. We didn't need, we, didn't, we all didn't need a Segway. Most of us have legs of some other mode of transport. We didn't need this two-wheeled monstrosity, unless you were a tourist. The reason that technology has the potential to fundamentally change the legal system is that the system was already in the grip of a much older and far more corrosive malaise, to which I'll uh, now turn. So the development of what Weber called the, the, the bureaucratic state, this model of complex legal um, ordering that we have in our society has long been studied and explained. The extreme levels of bureaucracy and complexity have been recognized by many. It's even given a popular buzzword. It's been given a popular buzzword by Richard Susskind, who I'm going to return to later. He's probably the, the, the most famous writer on this, on this subject, on the, the changing nature of the legal profession. He calls this, uh, this he's good at buzzwords as well, so that's cool. Um, he calls this hyper-regulation. Now, he's not he doesn't suggest by this phrase that regulation is not required. Most of it likely is. We, we need complex regulation to work, to, to work in our complex bureaucratic state. The, the, the current lives we have, the current operation of state requires detailed complex regulation. But the problem is that current systems are incapable of coping with this complexity. So for this reason, the complexity of the system requires experts to navigate it. These, these navigators, or lawyers to you and I, become more necessary as the complexity grows. They even become essential to even accessing elements of the, the legal system at all. They are high priests, if you will. But there's a problem. As access to the experts, and thus access to the whole system, the whole legal system, is now limited to those who have the funds to pay for them. For the majority, that is simply not an option. The cost of 
legal expertise, expertise excuse me, is prohibitive. Um, there is a lack of legal aid. We, we know these things. Um, even if you get legal aid, it's provided as a loan. The central state, I love the concept, the central state accuses you of something, of an offence, and then charges you 8% for the privilege of being defended by a lawyer. An interesting concept. But even if access is possible, even if you can get access to your priests, if you can afford the high priest, the lawyer, the process itself is deeply unfair. None of this critique is new, of course. In fact, the, the seminal discussion of the crisis of the Western legal system, or the Western bureaucratic model, was provided as long ago as probably 1974, with the work, the work of uh, Professor Mark Galanter in his um, famous uh, text, Why the Haves Come Out to Hate. Galanter, Mark Galanter's uh, depressing point was that law reform within the system was tinkering, as the subtitle of his famous essay made clear. He called it speculations on the limits of legal change. The, the bottom line being that you couldn't, you, the, the legal change within the system was doomed to, to fail. His work famously divided the, uh, those engaged with the law as either repeat players or one-shotters. Uh, one Repeat players are those who hold all the cards. It was, it's a detailed analysis. I'm not going to go into all, all of it, but I'll give you some sort of highlights. See, uh, the, the repeat player is not only a regular user of the legal system, and thus an expert with their own legal high priests, but the makers of the very rules that they are then held accountable by, because repeat players themselves influence the system. They create the rules by lobbying of decision makers, by influencing decision makers, and by playing the legal system, deciding whether or not to take a case, to settle, to avoid a, a case going to court. Many other mechanisms can be used by repeat, repeat players. The point is they have the resources to bleed the one-shotter dry. The one-shotter is the individual, probably most of us, who rarely uses the legal system um, and, and lacks all of the tools that the repeat player has. If you, if you want a, a, an analogy in popular culture, the repeat player is Denny Crane, and the one-shotter is Denny DeNuto. Or Danny DeNuto, my apologies. So according to Galanter's depressing conclusion, back in 74, uh, was that legal reform within this paradigm within the paradigm of the bureaucratic system, the complex legal system that we see today in Western societies, you cannot fix it. The system can't be fixed. Thus, the best efforts of, of community law or, or organizations like community law and lawyers who do legal aid and pro bono work and all those who, who help one-shotters and attempt to even the system can, little, can do little more than address the worst excesses of a system that is always biased. It's fundamentally, institutionally biased towards the repeat player. According to him, the paradigm of the complex bureaucratic legal system is beyond redemption, which is a depressing but logical conclusion from, from his work. So if we, but if we thought things were bad in the 1970s, when Galanter wrote his famous piece, things are a lot worse now. Increasing complexity challenges some of the very principles upon which we base our legal system. For example, the idea that ignorance of the law is no excuse. We've all heard this term. Yeah, ignorance of the law is no excuse. It's a famous maxim. It has become, but it's become ridiculous. We sign our lives away in contract terms that we simply don't understand. Um, excuse me. Um, th this is a famous example of, of exposing the, the craziness of, of how we sign up to these. These are click and wrap contracts. You don't need to know the details, but particular types of contracts we click online. This is the Norwegian uh, Consumer Council um, a couple of years ago um, did a live reading 
of the terms and conditions for 33 apps. Now, the reason they chose 33 was because at that point, it was a few years ago now, I think it would be bigger. Now, it was the average number of apps that individuals have on their phone. And they chose the, you know, sort of the popular uh, apps. And then, and they did a live reading of this. It took 32 hours for them to read these apps. The individuals, of course, just click, you know, oh yeah, I want that, I'll click, done. No idea what we're signing up to. Um, as you can see, they were quite happy when they were finished. I'm not surprised. The complexity and the, the problems we have in, si in signing up to various, I mean, this is just one example you can find, you, you know it in your daily lives, we sign up to things left, right, and center without really checking the details. Because it's hardly surprising that in 2014, in a famous experiment conducted by a Finnish uh, data company, six Londoners gave away their firstborn children, <laughs> unknowingly one hopes, in exchange for free Wi-Fi. <laughs> Um, the Finnish company then contacted the parents concerned and said that um, as they had nowhere to put the children, they were going to return them to their care. Very kind of them. Anyway, the serious point, of course, was that people click on this stuff and it, 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 we have no idea what you're doing. Yet the fundamental principle of our legal system is still on the basis that we do. In summary, therefore, the, the Western legal system has created a level of complexity that is in, makes it impossible to understand without expert navigators, without lawyers. In fact, one can, cannot even access much of the system at all uh, w without um, such um, lawyers, and therefore few can do so. Even if you get access to a high priest, a lawyer, then you encounter the one shorter repeat player problem, that you're, you're always up against the, the bias of the system. But now, the level of complexity and the costs it, it entail are even putting pressure on repeat players, such as the level of the complexity that we have created. Even experts struggle with the complex uh, uh, bureaucratic state that we have created, with the piles of contract terms and the details that we have to do almost everything. Hyper-regulation, therefore, has created a perfect storm where nobody's happy. But fear not, because help is at hand. Now for the first time, certainly in the modern era, with the growth of the bureaucratic state and the ever-growing complexity of our formal Western legal system, we may have the opportunity to build systems that can cope with the complexity of the modern world and address uh, hyper-regulation, possibly. And this comes about, of course, with the growth of computerization, of automation, and particularly so-called artificial intelligence. Uh, the growth of AI in particular, um, in fact, it's, it's mostly, certainly from my understanding, I'm not an expert, but it's, it's not artificial intelligence, mostly it's um, uh, adaptable technology. It's, it's, it's uh, programming and software that can adapt to different situations. So it's not so much artificial intelligence, but nevertheless, um, software um, and um, computing power, which can deal with mundane but complex, complex tasks um, through, through a process away from the, the, the person, through a computer, or with the aid of technology. From driving directions to language learning, we do it on an app. Uh, and law is part of that process. There are a number of obvious changes to the legal system or to the operation of, or issues around the legal system that, that uh, you can use as examples. Um, the most obvious is the growth in access to legal information on the internet. Um, the internet is full of legal information. Content is not the problem. Content is easy to find. Making sense of that content is the problem. Understanding which to rely on and which not. But now legal apps, of course, can bridge that gap. They can uh, answer legal questions. You may have seen the development of legal bots where, it, where uh, a complex software can, not actually that complex in some cases, can answer real normal language uh, legal questions, provide you with an answer, able to provide legal answers from your phone. 
this is not actually a new phenomenon, the growth of, of legal bots and, and uh, computing power to answer legal questions. And in fact, um, Richard Susskind, who I mentioned earlier, he actually, who's the, probably the most well-known writer on this issue of, of uh, uh, computing power and the influence on uh, the uh, legal profession and professions uh, generally, he made his name designing such systems for law firms uh, back in the 1990s, designing software that would answer legal questions. You enter the data, the legal answer will come out, saving loads of time and man, man hours, or women hours, person hours. It's very difficult these days. Anyway, um, he, he wrote, uh, he's written The End of Lawyers. You may have um, come across his books. He wrote uh, The Future of Lawyers, and then he wrote The Future of the Professions. He, he, by his own admission, he publishes the same book every five years. So um, if you've read one, you've read them all. But anyway, um, the point is that the bulk of, as, as he pointed out, or he points out, the bulk of legal tasks are particularly suited to such um, mechanisms, to such... Uh, mechanization because most legal tasks are not that difficult. They're time consuming and they're complex, but they're not that difficult. You can get a computer to do it. You can get some, uh, uh, most of them, not everything, but most. Um, the recent change, so the, the change is not the fact that we've had com uh, computers and technology that would do this sort of stuff. That's existed for a while. I'd remember this uh, 20 years ago. But the difference is now we can get access to it from a mobile device or that you can carry it with you everywhere, or at least you can, you can get access to it from, from, from somewhere due to the internet and the growth of apps. Susskind's hyper-regulation may thus be tamed. However, more than taming hyper-regulation, hyper there is even the potential to remove it entirely. Um, the clearest example of how this can occur is in the use of uh, distributive ledger technologies which I'm sure you've, or you may have heard of in the, the press. Uh, blockchain is the most famous. Um, it was the first. It's, I, from speaking to people who are experts on these things, it's not the best. Uh, there are far, greater, far better models than uh, blockchain. Developed to resolve ownership of, of Bitcoin. What distributed ledger technologies provide, let's just call them DLTs because I'm going to trip over the words, um, is a much higher degree of certainty to the system or in a system than at present. They allow ownership transfer swiftly and without the need to prove ownership and without the need, if they work correctly, with, of intermediaries to help you shift that ownership transfer. The risk is therefore dramatically reduced. There's no need, therefore, if they work, if all this stuff it works, to have the insurance that the high priest brings. And, and much of, when, when you go and use a lawyer, much of what you're actually, or can be the case, you could probably do this yourself, but you buy the lawyer and because if something goes wrong, you want to put the blame over there. You don't want to, if you're exchanging a house, you're buying a house, you want that risk not to lie on your, your own shoulders if something goes wrong, you want it to lie on the professional. But if that risk's removed, you don't need the professional. The complexity can still be there under um, DLTs, but we don't need to know about how it works. Law becomes like driving. Uh, we don't need to know how a car works. We just turn the key and then we drive. We don't need a mechanic to sit next to us. There's no need, if, if it works, for a lawyer, for your high priest, for your navigator. Now, of course, there are many skeptics to these ideas. Um, perhaps the changes will not have the impact that is predicted. Um, and there are problems. There is no doubt. So in terms of legal apps, for example, some of them, not to put too fine a point on it, are not very good. They, I wouldn't rely on them. Um, they, they, they give poor answers. Um, and I remember at the early days of, of, of IT around uh, law teaching back in the night, some of the products were dreadful. Um, we've also got the Bitcoin issue. That there are issues around Bitcoin. I wouldn't put my money in it. There's security problems with um, at the mining end. We've seen uh, problems with uh, hacking at mine, not at the not with DLTs, but at the mining end. So there's issues there too. But the point to remember is we are right at the start of this process. It's like. Um, Mr. Baines, designing his car, 
in the, uh, in, I love, I went to see this in, in Munich, this actual thing, sitting in the Deutsche Museum in Munich. And there wasn't even like, there wasn't like a big sign or anything saying, this is the first car. You felt you went in and saying, well, of course it's the first car. It's Germany. We built the first everything. Um, but they, anyway, they, they, but it's there, and it's pretty cool. But the point is, when, when this was designed, nobody thought, oh, this is, is going to change the world. This is going to get everybody moving. It's going to totally trash the environment. That's what this is going to do. Yeah? They would think, some idiots built a moving tricycle. Fantastic. You couldn't use it. There were no roads. They broke down all the time. And it turns out, it changed the world. Not necessarily for the better, but it changed the world. Um, and we've seen this happen already in this field. Um, email in the 1990s. Susskind himself often makes a... He claims that the Law Society in England, England and Wales, tried to ban him from talking about email because it was such a threat. Uh, I'm not, there's no evidence this quote ever happened, but it's a good story. Um, the, the real point is that there was a real... That people couldn't believe email... Lawyers are never going to use email. It's too, there's no security. You, you won't, it's too risky. We're never going to use email. Guess what? <laughs> Everything by email. Um, so the end result of this process is less than clear. And I don't, I don't know the future. Um, as we struggle to cope with these new ways of doing things. And Alex Sims, my colleague who spoke recently at, uh, from the University of Auckland, she talks a lot about this in more detail than me. But the problems that the current system has means that these new technologies and different ways of thinking about law and legal systems have fertile soil on which to grow. Um, they will change, I think, the very nature of the legal system because the current system is broken. These, these technologies are not the segue. They're the internet. They're the Benz. They're the, the Mercedes-Benz. So if the nature of the legal system and thus legal practice is destined to fundamentally change, then what of the legal academy? So let's turn to that question. So in, in New Zealand, the legal academy has a, a strong link to the profession. Um, it began life explicitly as a means of training lawyers. That's what law schools were about. According to a very an English idea, that law is a vocational, not an academic discipline. That's the, the New Zealand tradition. That's where we come from. It was not until the late 19th century that law became a university, excuse me, that law uh, became a university subject or a subject that people had to study at university to become a lawyer in England. It was one the part of legal education to go to university to study law. I say England advisedly. In Scotland and in co uh, following the continental tradition, lawyers went to university in England they didn't. The reason being that in Scotland people were more intelligent, obviously. <laughs> what? Um, um, and in, in England you could argue, and certainly sociologists have argued, that it was brought into the, into the university system more for the kudos that the university system brought, uh, legal um, practice, etc., than from the academic endeavour that they thought would, would occur at university. But anyway, this approach, this link, this strong link between the profession and training of lawyers and legal education has lingered longer in New Zealand, I think, than in England itself. Um, it was not until the 1960s, I think, and I couldn't check my um, sources on this. Um, I've written an article on it, but I couldn't find the source. But I think it's the 1960s that the first professor of law was appointed in the South Island. I may have got that slightly wrong. It's about then. I don't want any letters. Um, but anyway... Uh, but perhaps because of this, this connection between law as a, a vocational subject, there is a strong formalist tradition in the uh, in legal academy, in about teaching of law in New Zealand. The law schools teach primarily in New Zealand the formal law, what goes on in the courts. If a theoretical base is considered for how law is approached uh, in most New Zealand law schools, if it's considered at all, then it's, uh, and I have to say, I don't think that's always the case, um, then it's, it's, um, it's this. It's the, it's the ideas of, of uh, HLA Hart. Herbert Lionel Aloysius Hart, which you can, that's why he called himself HLA, you can see. What a name. Anyway, according to Hart, law is defined by its form. Law is defined, that's what makes it different. It's a form of rules Headed by a rule of recognition, that's the rule that 
that uh, everything else owes its um, legitimacy to. And divided into secondary rules, those are the procedure, I need to know all these details, the procedures by which rules are made. And finally, the primary rules at the practical, the rules that affect the, your, your society. Law, according to this, is everything in the pyramid. And everything that's outside the pyramid is not law. So if it's legitimized by your rule of recognition, it's law. If it's not, it's, it's something else. It's rules. It's custom. It's whatever. But it's not law. This formalist approach fits neatly into the idea that the norm for a law graduate uh, is to practice as a lawyer. And the expectation of practice as a primary destination for students um, I think still exists, and we, we talk about that as a norm for law students before they do other things, despite the fact that half of law students today in New Zealand law schools go on to do those other things. But I think this is the, if, if the real theoretical, that is the theoretical base, although I don't think many, everybody thinks about it. Now we should at this point recognise that there are many legal academics and legal thinkers in New Zealand who would recognise the inadequacies with this formal approach. And some in New Zealand challenged the formal uh, vocational orthodoxy. But, but they remain the minority, I think. Most current attempts by law schools in New Zealand, and to be honest, in Australia and the UK and the USA to address the issues I've been talking about, have been woefully inadequate. In most cases, there is the briefest of references to ideas outside this pyramid at the start of each undergraduate's journey. So they'll talk about alternative dispute resolution, and there'll be references to the, the ombudsman, and then the disputes tribunal, possibly, a bit of the practicalities of law at the district court. And then you'll have four years of a relentless diet of appeal court cases. You will take your medicine. Because most law schools suffer from something that famous uh, American academic, uh, Jerome Frank, called appeal court-itis. They're obsessed with the appeal courts. They talk all about those, those big cases, those high-level cases, not what goes on, in the, on the ground. Now, even if we believe that the current model is the best way to train lawyers, and it'll come as no surprise that I don't, um, this training model is becoming increasingly unsustainable. Uh, law schools turn out a lot of law graduates. But if we're going to need, uh, excuse me, get this right. Um, sorry, law schools turn out a lot of law graduates. But if we're going to need less high priests, why would we need the seminaries? It's this realization that has led to general panic, and I'm not, I'm not over, not underestimating this. General panic that has gripped many law schools overseas, particularly in the U.S., as student numbers have plummeted. So in 2010, there were 52,000 law students in the United States. That's a lot of law students. In 2015, there were 37,000. That's a fall of 30%, just under 30%. And I failed maths, and I can figure that out. So nearly a third. Um, Lower-ranked schools have seen a 50% fall in applications in the past 10 years in the United States. Um, some law schools have gone to the wall. You might have seen this in the newspapers because um, some of their former students have taken uh, cases against them. So at least they learned something. <laughs> the reason, of course, is not difficult to see. There's been a collapse in the legal job market, or at least a fundamental change in, in the, the types and the, and the numbers of legal careers. So what about New Zealand then? That's the US. What about New Zealand? Well, as yet, there is no panic, and there are reasons for this. Um, the connection between the law school and the profession isn't as strong in New Zealand as it is in the US. If you study law in the US, you're going to become a lawyer. You're going to become a practicing lawyer, uh, because it's so expensive and it's so professionally focused. Law schools in New Zealand are cushioned by the fact that the law degree still recognizes a badge of quality by other professions and other People, despite the fact, I think most people have no idea what's actually taught in a law degree, but they still see it as a badge of quality. But the same trends are visible here. The number of practicing lawyers, although it is still growing, it grows at a much slower rate. The growth is much lower. Um, law, student law student applications to law school seem to be flatlining. And if these trends continue, and less and less students enter the legal profession, 
how long can the current model survive? So does the end of lawyers, to quote Susskind, mean the end of the legal academy? The end of me. So now at this point, I'm going to give away the ending because I'm not, very, I'm not a mystery writer. And the answer is, the answer is no. The answer is no. But the legal ac academy is going to have to be a very different beast from the current model if it's going to survive, both in terms of how it teaches and how it perceives its role. This is likely also to apply how law schools sit within universities. For if law schools are about training lawyers, then I think they will surely die. To survive, I think the legal academy needs to shift the paradigm. Ironically, not to some future focused IT whiz-bang model. And quite frankly, most legal academics are woefully inadequate or incapable of delivering such uh, courses. Uh, many such attempts for law schools to become modern, you know, they're excruciatingly awful. It's like watching your dad dance. <laughs> We, we also have to be really careful that the, the shift towards vocational teaching and vocational qualification, oh, we need to be focused on the, on the, on the vocation, what's practical and so on. Well, my, my mother is also who's an academic, um, and uh, she was awarded an MBE for her services to, uh, to, uh, to education in Scotland. She was a Republican and opposed the honours system right up until the moment she got one. Um, <laughs> sorry, Mum. Um, Anyway, she, she, she always used to tell the electron microscopy story. Bear with me. There's relevance. Um, so when she, she was a biologist, a geneticist. And when she started, electron microscopes were the size of a small planet. And you needed real com complex engineers and so on to work them. And people trained to run electron microscopes. And then, of course, by the time they'd finished training, um, a monkey could run the damn thing. You didn't need some technical thing. The life had, the world had moved on. Hell, I've used an electron microscope. That's how easy they are to use today. So you have to be careful that you're not fighting yesterday's wars when you're trying to, to modernize your education system. So no, the future of legal education, like, like so many things, is to be understood in remembering the past. Um, the, um, oops, go back. the important point to hammer home here is that the Discipline of law is not about lawyers, it's about law. And that's a fundamentally different thing. And it's far broader than the Eurocentric formalism of heart, that pyramid. Once we remember this, the future of, of law as an academic discipline becomes much clearer. So what is it? Well, at this point, we can, we can get rid of David Brent and enter our unlikely hero. You need a hero. This is our hero. I know he's a dead white guy, but, you know, he's still a hero. This is Carl Llewellyn. Carl Llewellyn was a famous legal philosopher from the US, still famous for his realist idea. He was a hard-nosed, he wasn't some basket-weaving philosopher, though. He's a pretty hard-nosed legal academic. He wrote the US Commercial Code. And what he said, law isn't a formal. Law isn't just the way that the formality. Law is about how things work in practice. And so he went, and with the, his, his co-worker, Hobel, he looked at how, what makes a society tick? What makes a society work? That, he said, is law. And in doing so, he came up with something called the law jobs. He said, these need to be done by every society in some form, in some way. So it's not the, it's not the form that matters. It's that these functions are performed. And wherever those are, functions are performed, that is your law. So you find this by looking at the Cheyenne in the famous in the, the Cheyenne Way, this is a famous book, um, where he and his argument was that the Cheyenne do this completely differently from Western societies, but they still they still do it. And you need to do these to make your society function. You need to resolve trouble cases, that's dispute resolution. You need to channel expectations, rule making. You need to have some way of people knowing what the rules are. You need to have some way of getting direction, and you need to have some way of allocating authority within your society, within your group. And however you do that, that's law. That's the definition of law. So obviously, as a Scottish person, if we look to the resolving the trouble case, dispute resolution, I find unstructured violence an awesome way of resolving disputes. It's a method. 
If we look to Pacific Island states, it's obvious that this system, this way of approaching law, works much better than the formality, than the formal hearts model. Much of, uh, we had the, U the Pacific Law and Culture Conference recently. And uh, of course, custom there is so important. And it doesn't fit within hearts model, um, but it fits within this. But in our society too, Llewellyn's view holds. In fact, it's, got, it's increasingly relevant um, because these jobs are increasingly being done outside the formal system. The vast majority of people simply don't use formal dispute resolution, for example. If they get anywhere near the formal system, they use alternative dispute resolution or the ombudsman. New technologies only increase this phenomenon. I've, I've heard some people say, legal academics even, that these new technologies mean that we won't use law anymore. But that's wrong. You can't escape law. We won't use the current formal system anymore in these legal, in these uh, IT models. But if we're doing the law jobs, it's still law. So our legal system may leave lawyers behind, but law by its very nature will remain. It's like Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave. You're not going to escape law. But the shift in the nature of the legal system requires a shift in the nature of how we think about law and how we teach it. So what does this mean for the, what does this shift away from the formal legal system mean for the expert navigators and for legal academics and for us? Well, to put it simply, I think it means that everybody is going to need to be, become a lawyer. In the way that, who goes to a travel agent these days? Who went to travel agent in the last year? Okay, there's a few people who sheepishly put their hand up. <laughs> but let's be honest, we rarely, if you go in somewhere complex, or there might be some reason, yeah? But most of the time, we get on the internet and we book it ourselves. And we don't book it randomly. We, we have some idea what we're doing. We know the concept, we know about visas and flight schedules and luggage restrictions and currency. And very, we know, know the basic frame about booking a holiday. Whereas back in the day, you just rock up, give the, the travel agent the money, and off you went. Now you need to know stuff. And the same is increasingly becoming true of law. The problem is that law schools currently operate as if in the business of training lawyers. They're not in the business of training lawyers. They're, they're like the stagecoach companies of the American West. They thought they were in the business of running stagecoaches. They weren't. They were in the business of carrying mail and passengers and goods. And the railways did it better than them. And the only stagecoach companies that survived were the ones that bought railway companies. Because they knew they were in the business of moving people, not in the business of running stagecoaches. So law needs to be taught in every degree, in every subject, to everyone. In a sense, relevant to individual disciplines and people's lives. And understood in this way, the future of legal academia is secured, but increasingly disconnected from the profession. Their paths ever diverging as the nature of the legal system changes. So, to conclude, the rapid advancement of technology holds out a hope that the current malaise of the complex legal system can be resolved or at least reduced. It provides the tools for a legal reformation, if you will. Religion without the priests, law without the lawyers. That the, law, that the legal system may no longer be the preserve of the few should be celebrated. But in the face of these societal changes, the legal academy faces a stark choice to continue its model of legal training towards a dwindling profession, or remember that it's not in the business of training lawyers, but in educating people about and researching the nature of law. This doesn't preclude the, the need to train legal experts. You're probably going to still need a few of them. But this is part of a much wider mission. To survive and prosper, the legal academy and the universities in which it operates need to think outside of, the, outside of their self-imposed box. They need to remember, or excuse me, that law schools need to remember what their role is and embrace fundamentally different ways of thinking about law, about how we do the law jobs, for law is far too important important to be left to lawyers. Kaki Diano, thank you for your time. And if anybody wants to ask me questions, you can. Thank you, Charlie.
International Commission uh, on Criminal it's a bit left field, but I'll take it. Um, well, the Americans don't recognise it already. That's the first point. My expert colleague on this up there, so got me careful. He knows about the ICC. Uh, the Americans don't recognise it at the present time. Um, the the issue, uh, I mean, it's quite scary that they would then impose their views on others. Um, I, we'll have to see how it plays out. I mean, the response of the court was interesting today, because they just said, we'll carry on doing our mission, which is to apply the rule of law. Um, People have tried to do these sort of things in the past, and it hasn't worked. It's, an, it's um, the power of... I always think, the thing about international, this is completely off topic, but <laughs> the power of international law, and people forget how powerful it is, because in the ninth, prior to the Second World War, um, the states engaged in things which were quite appalling by our standards now. And people say, oh, international law doesn't change anything. Yeah, but states, at least if they do that, they attempt to hide it. They know they're doing wrong. And the fact that, that the, the, the fact that the US is worried is interesting. So the answer is I don't know. <laughs> but I suspect it's not as catastrophic as but does it challenge the whole idea of law and order if they just turn around and say we're not gonna look at the law. Well they they do that anyway. They do that in, in uh, they do that in, in other ways. It's always the time. Well you know, yeah, I think it's a bit harsh. You were uh, saying that law needs to be taught to everyone. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how you see that happening in a society like which channels and that kind of thing? Uh, I think it's a, yeah, that's it. I quite the idea. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> at university level, I think law schools have to. Um, leave their stop just teaching law. I think they need to be teaching law to engineers and to uh, medical, you know, people working in the medical profession or uh, political science or whatever, you know, doing law and so you do it in the, as part of your other subjects. So at the moment there's a particular focus on delivery of a law degree. And I think much of you can teach law to other people you, you, in so other disciplines. It's a bit like engineers having management paper. Oh, absolutely. So, so, yeah, at one level. I mean, there'd be lots of different ways of doing this. I think it has to be further, though, because, of course, a lot of people don't go to university, or, and it needs to be taught there, too. I think there's a long argument in New Zealand about civics. This has gone on for a long time, that we don't teach civics, or, or where we do, we teach it badly. So I think teaching people about the basics of a legal system become essential um, there. But that's not an argument you're going to win at the moment. The NCA and the, the, the curriculum is full. It, it requires a different uh, approach. But I think... The problem at the moment is that all these, that, that you, the thing that gives, all those exciting, all these internet, uh, these um, uh, computerized, uh, sorry, computer, um, using of apps and so on to get access to legal information, you've got to be able to tell which is worthwhile listening to and which are not, or which one are using and which are not. And that requires a degree of training. And um, I can probably figure it out, but other people can't. Um, and we'll sign off their students, they sign off their, their, their children. Sorry. I think I think you're right. I think there is a so so amongst the legal filling profession is a, is is not stupid. There's a lot of people and a lot of money involved. So they have tended they are now moving towards these sort of technologies. But I would question whether they could keep con whether the big firms could keep control of that. Um, and certainly at the moment there are, there, it's much cheaper, it's much cheaper to provide legal advice through these, through, through such technologies. So it's not going to, and therefore I think the, the market would undercut them, would be my thought. Um, I'm a little worried because some people are saying If, yeah, if you could poor data in, it leads to poor, poor... Yeah, well, you do have, Yeah, so you do have the problem at the moment that it's a different issue, but you get poor advice then spread around the internet. So we can, which is a slightly different point, but yeah, I, I don't, I agree. Sorry, um... Laws are made generally static, and that's very slowly. So how do you Well, it depends. Yeah. It dep 
compare, the law changes actually law changes fast. Law changes very quickly. Not not statute law, but law in the courts and law in um, and law through regulation. Particularly at the moment when we see such a massive shifting nature of society to regulation behind. So so law can move uh, fast. I think what you need to do is to teach people to be aware of where things are, of the basics, and also. Hopefully, if you can use, um, if they can use technology to get to get the information, to provide them with a better um, grasp of the system, then at least they'll know the information when they get. Um, you talked about lawyers and how to take legal information out to the public, right? Um, and use uh, the need to rely on the, the, the tradition of law. Do you haven't said anything about judges? Do you think that um, taking legal education out to the public might also make uh, judges uh, uh, less relevant in the future? In other words, could members of the public perform the judge's role applying uh, common sense and the little bit of uh, legal education that the universities might be able to Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there, there are experiments looking at this as to whether you can have a, um, I'm not convinced by them, but whether you can have a sort of, uh, a, 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 larger numbers making decisions. So having arbitrators that would be a panel, a large panel, of individuals that could, could decide uh, on, a, on a decision, and therefore get rid of the, the nature of a judge, um, potentially. You could potentially do that. I mean, the thing I would say at the moment, we have a vet, the, the procedure around around cases. So we, whenever you go to a, a, a court, it's a highly expensive business. The whole procedure is expensive. It's heavily it's heavily procedurally based, and you could probably strip all of that out um, if you really went back to basics and thought about what you're actually going to do. But the the issue, the specific point about the having individuals making decisions. That's, I don't know much about these experiments, but I know that it's being looked at. And amongst some communities in the States, where the, the arbitration will be through group, through group arbitration, online communities. So it'd be worth looking at. I have no idea. We need to talk to people who have much more psycho psychological understanding than me. Do I trust the masses? Sorry, I'm such an elitist. That's a good question. Um, hmm. I, I, I'm not sure. That it, I'm not sure. I'm, if it depends what happens, but if it strikes me that there will still be the need for some experts, but I would wonder if the generalist lawyer expert still needs to be there. You know, do you need to? Because we have this concept rather like doctors you teach a doctor, and they'd have lots of general expertise and then a specialism. And lawyers the same way. You have all this information. I'm not convinced as we move towards. Uh, more uh, different ways of, of doing things, whether you'll need that generalist law, you might. I think there'll be less of them. Um, but I think the way forward is probably to, as I said before, to look towards, to, to, I think it'll be smaller, and then you'll teach law into other disciplines. So for example, your, your engineer needs to, I mean, they already do. Engineers need to know some law. Yeah? Um, but, and I think it will be more, become more necessary because they're not going to be able to get the expert. So that you've got to become your own expert up to a point. So I haven't really answered the question, but uh, I think well, I think it would shrink in terms of numbers, in terms of size. But it's a very good question. It's a it's a possible it's a possible model. I mean, there are um, Whitehead is la launching a BA in law, so it won't be a practicing law degree. Um, and um, there are other models of that where you do law as part of your degree. So that's a, it's a potential model. Yeah, it would be interesting to see. I think somebody else raised their hand. Did you? Yeah, um, but does that necessarily mitigate the need to have lawyers? Um, because as you see it, as things are progressing, surely there will still be a need for mm. lawyers within some disciplines. So what areas of the law mm. will still be reserved for, for lawyerly functions? Yeah, that's the need a, for courts and judges. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I think that's a, it's another good point. I would <coughs> argue, I suspect, that you will still retain expertise because people will pay for that expertise. 
but I think there will be less people. I mean, at the moment, people can't pay for lawyers. That's a fundamental problem. You're either very poor or, or, or wealthy. The middle <coughs> don't pay for lawyers. Um, so if you've got an option of using something else, wouldn't you go there? Wouldn't you use those alternatives? But I, uh, you might keep the generalists. I think, sorry, so experts, high priests, if you will, of the system will remain for those that want to pay for them. But I still think that the, the, the professions, as we're seeing in the States, will shrink. I don't think you'll have such a, such a need for it. Um, but surely within the realm of criminal law, you'll need to retain lawyers as advocates, right? Uh, there's a point, yeah. I think you're right. Except for the So if we, put it this way, if we keep the criminal law like it is, yes, absolutely. Where it's a procedurally focused, highly, uh, you need a lawyer to, to find your way through the procedural morass. If it shifts, though, if it changes, then no. You don't need to have law. You don't need to have a procedurally focused system the way we do. You don't. So we, we, we work from a premise that you, you, know, you have your lawyer, and then you have your lawyer, and then, and then we go to an adversarial system, and up in front of a judge on our criminal model. It's highly procedurally focused. You don't have to do that. You could do it in different ways. I'm not saying we will. I'm not saying we will. So if we stay with the, the, the current procedural model, yes, you're going to need a lawyer. The reason you need a lawyer in the criminal system is primarily because of the uh, because of the complexities that surround it, um, and indeed in our whole system, you need that high priest. But maybe it'll be cut out. I think, to be honest, I think the criminal system would be the last to go if if it went at all, because it's so embedded within our system. We don't we don't have a, we have a, an adversarial model, and it would be very, and, and that requires equality of arms and advocacy. To, do you mean in, in terms of what? In terms of technology? In terms of yes, uh -huh. So we're seeing a shift. Probably the most dramatic shift is in is in England and Wales, where you no longer will have to have a law degree to be a lawyer. You just have to do a degree, and then you do a, a practicing um, practicing qualification degree, I don't know what it is, whatever it's called, it's just new. Um, I'm not sure if that's the way to go, but it's a dramatic shift. And it's going back to the vocational model. Um, in terms of technology, um, we've seen uh, registries in Sweden put on online. It wasn't a huge success in land registries put online. We need a lawyer. We put, put online using um, distributive legislative uh, uh, DLT. Um, We've also we've seen some experiments in India to try and reduce fraud around this. Um, again, reducing the need for a lawyer. So it's, it's very early days in terms of the technology, but I can't believe it won't have those fundamental impacts because there is a problem. Because there is a problem. Um, in terms of uh, other, the legal education system is a, is, a, is a conservative beast. It'll be fascinating to see what happens in the UK, um, in England, in Wales, sorry, I should say, where the shift away from you don't have, you wouldn't need a law degree to become a lawyer. What that will do to law schools. Um, my suspicion is what will happen is that law schools will actually target themselves towards the, the exam that happens afterwards, which I think is probably the exact opposite of what you need to be doing. But that's another, that's a, that's a complex issue. Sorry, if somebody over here. If, if the future is now, Oh, I have to speak to my boss. He's sitting up there. <laughs> <laughs> what would I do? What would I do now? Yeah. I would start teaching law on other subjects. I would so stop yeah, sitting. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. I would just stop sitting in our little silo, and then just teaching law as a, as a law degree. I would think that law has to be taught. We have to go out, and we have to be teaching law to everywhere, to to other disciplines. So, in an immediate thing, that would be my first, the first, the first change. Um, but yeah, and, and a, a longer term, I would think about the focus that we have on the content of the law, and I would think about um, thinking much more about the law jobs, how things are how things are done, which will often be in non non court based, uh, much more uh, fluid uh, models in practice. That's how things work. So that would be my 
thought, but I don't know whether my boss agrees. Well, yeah, there you go. Um, so the making of laws. So, so we have, um, I mean, one of the problems we have generally in our system, of course, is people don't understand the process that we make laws. They don't understand the laws when they're passed. There's a fundamental problem in our, in our system. We just sort of accept it. Um, uh, you, you could see uh, changes. I mean, we, we've, but we, in, in a representative system like ourselves, I, I don't see huge shift. Um, and, and sorry, through Parliament, we have a representative Parliament. We don't have direct democracy. Um, you could see um, you could see some alterations in in that way. I can't see it in the. You'd have to. It would take a fundamental shift to the way we think, but it might happen. Once of the time, I'll take one more. That's a good point. Um, there's two options. I mean, you, you're right. We are. It is quite expensive in New Zealand if you compare us to some other systems. We are expensive. Some systems regulate fees, particularly in continental Europe. We don't. So you could you could do that. Um, lawyers will complain. I, I'm I'm not sure whether that complaint is true. Part of the issue, I think, though, is is we have a very complex procedural model. It takes a lot of time to do things in our system. It's not a and, and that's why. And, and, and that was why Galanter's um, so end result was very depressing, because he couldn't really see a way of fixing it without really fundamentally changing stuff. And I do wonder if, if technology allows you to at least simplify it. Simpl it's like being in a shop. You know, it's the front end. You go in and you buy your stuff. You don't care about what happens behind. So that would allow the complexity to still be there, but we don't need to see it anymore. So somebody else does it on your app, on your phone on your DLT, and thus taking the lawyer out of the equation, which would re reduce costs. So um, I, I, I'm with you. I think legal fees in New Zealand do seem high, but um, there are, I don't know the exact, the, I don't know the reasons. But uh, I'm with you. It's a, it's a PhD thesis on that. Sorry, so one other person, there's one more. There's one, yep. Well, I'll go for, I think you had, had your hand up before. So. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Would you think the decentralization of legal philosophy comes into legal philosophy and jurisprudence? Legal philosophy and jurisprudence. It'll prove Hart wrong. There you go. <laughs> prove Llewellyn right. Um, if, if, because the serious point is that all these different shifts, different changing natures of way of doing things fit within the law jobs, but they might not fit within Hart's model. So I think it just changed the theory of how we think about law. I'll do one more, I think, because we all want to go to our beds. Is there a reason why they're not attracting law students in the States? Is it a, is there some attitude towards profession, or is it the cost of the uh, uh, it's, uh, it's money. <laughs> it's because the, the, uh, there are less jobs at the end of the process. And therefore, so the, the, the US law degree is a postgraduate degree. It's extremely expensive. And you, uh, you are really training to be a lawyer. You're not really training to be anything else. Um, and therefore, if you, if you study, take that route, and there isn't a job at the end of the day, you end up in debt and you know, without a job to, that's going to pay for that debt. So therefore, students don't go. So I, that is the assumption that that's what's driving it. Surely there's too many lawyers in the States. I remember hearing um, one time in the history of the States that there was um, 10 lawyers There are more lawyers per sorry. Yeah, yeah, true. But there are more lawyers per head of population in New Zealand than there are in the States. <laughs> sorry? I, I believe it does it's a bit of a cheat to start, but it gets you know, it's good. Um, it, it depends how you measure lawyer. So I think if you do Germany, it could say hard because they have public lawyers who do your houses and things a bit differently, notaries. Um, but we're certainly up there and I think we're higher in the US. But um, 
There are other differences, but we have a more of a regulatory model. So one person, you, one more person. How do you define what is somebody who has a role with you, or somebody who goes to Okay, so I, I have used the New Zealand definition of lawyer, which is somebody who's a practicing, practicing lawyer. Because we're, we're unusual in New Zealand because we protect the term lawyer. Whereas in most countries it's barrister or solicitor or advocate or you know, avocat, juriste, whatever. Here we protect lawyers. So that was how I was using the term. And, but maybe that's the point. Maybe we need to think about the lawyer as a broader a conception. Maybe that's it. That's a good point. Oh, one more. Goodness me. Because for the last section, because if it all went wrong, I wanted it on their insurance. <laughs> so that was my point about the risk. That you're often uh, you're right, so you, it's not difficult to do the requirements for. But if you make a mistake and you made the mistake, that's a big transaction, a big lot of money that you have to front up. Whereas if you have a lawyer to do it, then hopefully the, the insurance or the law society insurance will front up. The people are leaving. <laughs> <laughs> so we won't call it. Sorry, no, no, no. <laughs> so, uh, Kakitiano, thank you for your time.